I'm super stoked about it because we're going to be talking about one of my favorite topics, which is Docker. Play this in the window. I'm learning all these tricks now with how to how to do this. Hell yeah. Share. Okay, so tell me you can see it. Good. Yep. Yes. Okay. So Docker is a tool that I've used for a, for a long time now. And my, my hope is that it, you know, that this assists kind of the, the dev process and the, and the, the development practice that we, that we practice here at Luke. Um, first, let's talk about what Docker is. So Docker is a tool that's designed to containerize software, essentially. It was developed originally for the IT world, and it was built originally with the idea that you would isolate software packages and tools from the rest of your operating system. Um, a lot of people describe it like a virtual machine, uh, and it behaves sometimes like a virtual machine uh, with the important distinction that it doesn't make use of a hypervisor like a, like a virtual machine does, and it uses the host architecture uh, for, for building, you know, for, for containerizing and building these applications. So um, some, some important things to know about it from, from, you know, from this level is that you're not going to virtualize like ARM architecture on an x86 platform and vice versa. You're not going to use it to run like Windows applications on a Linux system and vice versa. So um, it makes use of the, of the host operating system and the kernel, but it allows you to virtualize everything around that. Um, and I'll show you some examples. The vocabulary around this is, is important. Uh, when I talk about images, an image is a persisted snapshot, basically, of, of an instruction set. So an image uh, is not a dynamic thing. It is very static. An image is is invoked or is uh, instantiated into a container. So a container is basically a running instance of an image. And the way I usually like describe this to uh, PLC programmers, for example, is like um, an image is the is the function block object in your program. The container is the instantiated function block object. Um, so that's really important. An image, um, an image can be instantiated in multiple times, so you can have multiple containers running the same Im image on the same machine. So, in addition to these two objects, which are the, the main objects of Docker, you've also got uh, a Docker volume, which is a storage location. It's it's optional, but it's really common. Um, if you need data to persist outside of your running container, um, you would use volume to do that. Uh, and you can also create a Docker network, which creates um, a network object that allows you to um, create unique networks wrapped around these containers. So, for example, if you want to, um, if you want your Docker container to have a specific IP address that's separate from your host machine, you can do that by using a Docker network. Okay, so Docker is really designed around uh, a, the command line and, and using it as a command line tool. A lot of this is, is automated and I'm gonna show you um, some examples of that. But the basic Docker commands um, are, are these here. So pull is a download command that tells your, your Docker engine to pull an image from the Docker hub. 
this could be uh, the public Docker Hub. This could be your own private Docker Hub that you host locally. Um, it just depends on how your Docker is, your Docker engine is configured. Uh, Docker run command. This creates the running container from the image. So you're going to issue this when you want to instantiate that. Um, use, use start stop commands to start and stop the running container. Some, some containers are designed to run a basic task and then stop on their own. So for example, if you were, if you just had some simple Python scripts or, or something like that, that you wanted to run and process some data and output a, a value or a data table or something, um, you could have your, your container run do all of its work, push its output to a volume or even to the command line, and then stop on its own. This, it's actually fairly common. The hello world example I'm gonna show you uh, does just that. Other containers are designed to, to run and, and maintain. Um, and so you can, you can control the way in which they behave by starting and stopping them. Um, and you may have reasons to do that. Since the container is like an isolated, you know, since, since it does share some traits with a virtual machine, um, it may be running in the background and you might want to jump into it to do some work or it might be your test environment where you're testing things out and you wanna build your, your build instructions from commands that you're, you know, noodling around with in the container. You can break into it or you can, you can log into the container by using this execute command, um, or you can just use this to execute a command inside the container. So um, I'll show this to you as well. Um, you maintain these by doing a save or a load. So you can back them up to, like, to local files. Um, it doesn't, you don't always have to push it to the Docker Hub. You can save it locally as a tarball. Uh, you can load it locally as a tarball. Um, that's, this is the way that Greengrass intends to use, um, to use like custom Docker uh, images. Um, it's by using the save and the load, um, although you don't have to. And then you can always delete the containers and the um, images as well. Okay, the real power comes in like building these, building these containers and then um, creating like reusable images from these. So uh, you do this by using the commit command. So if you have a running container, you can go in and like do all your customizations. Uh, you can build it from a Docker file and then, uh, then you commit it. If you commit it, you can, you can commit it locally to, uh, you know, whatever your preferred name and tag name, and then uh, use the push command and you can push this up to Docker Hub. Uh, or to any, you know, again, any Docker, any Docker um, server. Um, the Docker Hub, which I'll cover after the slides, is rich with all sorts of different tools that have, that have been pre-built and are easily customizable. Um, and you can create your own public and private um, repositories. Okay, so. When we talk about automation around Docker, um, you know, it's really common to like spin up a container with a known image, go in there, uh, you know, add the packages you want, create some software, et cetera. Uh, and then you want to be able to do that like in an automated way. So um, Docker makes use of what's called the Docker file, which is basically build instructions for a Docker image. Um, this is an example. I'm, I'm going to show you this Docker file build. Um, but essentially, it tells the Docker engine how to build this container from a, from a list of um, instructions in serial. So this, for example, is going to run an apt get and install a bunch of packages. Uh, it's going to copy in some resources locally, run some pip install, et cetera, and then execute this web.py. Um, Python script. 
Okay, and I think this is my last slide, but um, there is also a tool that works alongside Docker called Docker Compose. This is a separate install from, from the Docker engine. It's not, um, it's not included in like the standard Docker engine, but Docker Compose is designed to, um, to coordinate multiple containers resources, um, describe the behavior in an instruction file, how it should start, what it should, you know, what it should couple to as far as external storage if you need devices attached to this, et cetera. So um, I'm gonna show you this as well. All right. Now, let me go here and share my browser. Okay, so you can find tons of information about Docker on the Docker Hub. And as you can see right here, uh, when I go to the Docker Hub, it loads into my, my uh, personal public Docker Hub. So I've created quite a few containers in the past, um, and I tend to throw them out when I realize I don't need them any longer. Um, but if you're looking for an example for a service, you can just search uh, different services in here. So if you want a Node-RED Docker container, so you want to run Node-RED and Docker, you can search this. It gives you the pull command. Typically, a good readme file here will also tell you how to run the container um, and what behavior to expect. The first container that we're going to, or excuse me, the first image that we're going to pull is called the Hello World image. This one here is designed really just to test your, your Docker install. So I'm going to grab this pull command here and I'm going to open Ubuntu. All right. Already got some, some resources in here, but let's just start from, from the beginning. Okay, let's just start from my home directory here. So here I'm in command line in Ubuntu. Um, the instructions on installing Docker, um, they're, they're pretty excellent and they're on docker.com. Um, I didn't include them because Docker takes a minute to install and I thought it was uh, not a good use of time here. But with Docker installed, you use snapped. Um, it's just snap install Docker. Uh, it's pretty easy. You can test your Docker uh, install by doing a Docker minus V. That should respond with the Docker, uh, the current Docker version. And so we know Docker's installed. We want to pull the hello world image. So let's just do a quick paste Docker pull hello world. <clears throat> It's going to run through the instructions, tell you when it's done. Now we can do a simple Docker run command against this. Uh, I'm going to use minus IT because I want to see how this machine is, is running. Um, I don't have to mount it to any networks or volumes or anything. So, um, and I, I don't care to name it. Um, let's do minus minus RM. So what this is going to do is it's going to run. It's going to print out some fun hello world stuff. And then it's going to remove itself. So the container will automatically delete itself. So there we go. We run it. It says hello from Docker, blah, blah, blah. If I do a Docker uh, PS minus A, this is a command to list all the existing containers. It shows me that it's not, it's not there any longer. If I remove this uh, RM, It'll run again if I do another Docker PS minus A. You can see it's there's a container there. 
um, but it's exited. So uh, you can you can essentially this this is a container that's designed to run once and then and then quit. Um, so you can you could leave it there. You could you know if, if this was something you used often, you could run like a Docker start and whatnot. But um, we don't care much. Okay, so simple Docker pull, simple Docker run, but maybe we want to run something that's a little more complex. So um, we can do that by running another Docker command, uh, Docker run. Uh, I want to see this again, so minus IT for interactive terminal. Uh, I want to mount this to my local network, so I'm going to do minus P uh, to attach a port, and I'm going to do 1880. It's host side and then container side uh, behind a colon. So minus P1880 on both sides. Um, I am not going to attach this to a volume because I, I don't care to persist this data. Um, let's do, uh, what is it? Node red. We'll just run it with node red. This is going to be the simplest run command here for something that's going to spin up a web interface and allow us a little bit of networking. So I'm really just going to do this Docker run minus IT, uh, mount it to these ports and run node red. So it's showing me that it's spun up. Um, if I open a browser here in this VM, uh, I can go to port 1880. You'll see it's created a a running instance of node red here. Um, just for giggles and grins, why don't you just pull in some simple nodes? We'll deploy this, we'll make sure that it's working. I'm injecting a timestamp to the debug console. You can see it's essentially working here. So cool, we have a running container. Um, I, I am logged into this, if I did, Control C, it would kill the node red service and it would actually kill the container. So I don't, I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm going to do Control P, Control Q, which just detaches the terminal from node red. So if I do uh, a Docker PS minus A, you'll see I've got my node red container running. It's telling me it's been up about a minute. It tells me some other robust stuff like what ports it's attached to. Okay. And what I do care about now is I care about this, this container ID. Because let's say I've, I've spun up this container and I want to make some changes to it um, and save it, reuse it somewhere else. So I can do uh, docker, docker commit. I'm going to paste the container ID. So this is this alphanumeric container ID. And I want to call this. Just a James Cox forward slash node red. So what this did now is it created uh, an image. I just created an image from this running container. So if I do Docker uh, images, this is going to show me my my images that have been created. There's my Jesse James Cox node red. Um, I want to make this available to another machine. So if I do uh, Docker log in. It logged into my Docker Hub. Now I do Docker push. Uh, Docker push. I don't even need options. I'm just going to say James Cox forward slash node red. So now this is uploading the, the container in its committed state to Docker Hub. And it is in the process, it's it's like compressing things. It is um, trying to build, this basically is building an automated Docker file. 
So now that it's done, if I, here, I'll just do it in this browser. They're just going to search for this. There's my node red container right there. So it pushed it. It's there. If I click here, I can copy this and let me see. Let's go to a whole different machine. Where are you, parallels? Okay, let's go now to parallels. So this is a this is a Debian machine based on Debian ten, and if I do uh, paste Docker pull. This node red container. This is now going to pull this container, and I can do Docker run minus it minus p. Uh, we have to use a different port because I already have node red running from Greengrass on this, so we'll do 1883 on the host side and 1880 on the container side. Pull slash node red. Okay, now this is running. Now this is the coolest. <laughs> uh, what did I say this was? 1883. So there's my container with my timestamp uh, injector and, and it's working. So two separate machines, uh, I'm able to deploy the same the same software package, just with simple command lines. So what I would like to show you now is how to, how to like one step into automating all of this. So I'm gonna go back now to my Ubuntu machine. Um, and we're gonna step through like building an actual application here. So um, let me open the, the folder. So I have a, a directory in here called camera app. And in this camera app directory, I have some resources, some, some Python scripts, and I have a Docker file. And this Docker file, uh, as I explained earlier, cre creates basically a instructs the system on how to build this Docker image. So um, it's going to tell me what base image to use. In this case, I want to use Ubuntu version uh, 18.04. Um, you can tag all kinds of like container specific ID information. In this case, I, as, as a general practice, I throw my email address in here. Uh, you issue your run commands, copy things into the, the image, basically it's spinning up a container with this 18.04, it's running these commands in it, then it's committing it and spinning itself down. So um, I wanna copy the resources into here. I wanna run some pip and I have a, an entry points telling me what, what language reference I'm gonna use and what I wanna command here. So in this case, we dot, dot pi. This is, uh, follows a very strict naming convention. This has to be called Docker file uh, with capital D Docker file. So this should make sense when I show uh, what this command looks like. So we'll actually just open this up in Visual Studio. And in the camera app directory, if I do a list, you can see I have my Docker file here. I'm gonna issue Docker build Minus T, so this, this is gonna tag my, my image that I'm creating. Uh, we're gonna call this uh, my name. We're gonna call it uh, cam, oops, cam app. And we'll tag it with, I don't know, some version, something or other. Uh, 
So this is my tag. And now I tell it where to find the Docker file. It's in the same directory I'm in now, so I'm just going to um, add a period here. So this is now going to run through the build instructions, and you can see it. You can see it working. It's going to pull the Ubuntu image. It's going to run the installs. It's going to um, run all of this loading, um, loading the external resources and whatnot. And when it's finished, it will have created this, um, this image that I created in the tag. So what this, what this is designed to do is create just a simple Flask-based web page that has access to my camera uh, that can take pictures from my, my uh, Mac camera and save them in a file system. So while this is building, um, we'll talk next about Docker Compose, um, which I mentioned earlier. So we're actually going to spin this up using Docker Compose. I'm not going to issue a Docker run command. I'm simply going to issue a Docker Compose command. And what this is going to do is similar to the Docker file. It's going to step through spinning this, this up. So um, it's going to create a volume. This volumes instruction here creates a volume called captures. Um, next, it's going to run services. So it's going to spin up an image uh, from Silverwind called Droppy, which is a HTML-based uh, storage app. It's going to mount it to the local network under ports 8089, so we have access to that. Um, it's also going to issue this restart command, unless stopped means, unless I explicitly go in and stop this, if I reboot my PC or I reboot this virtual machine or I reboot whatever is running the Docker host, um, the image will spin itself back up. So, um, and the data persists. Um, if I issue a stop command, then it will stop and the data uh, is dumped unless it's mounted to a volume. Um, I'm going to run, uh, spin up my second, uh, my second container. This one, I think I just called it cam app. And I did what well, tag 0 0.0.1. I'm going to mount this to ports 8080 on the local host. And I'm also going to mount my camera device to this and uh, mount it to the captures volume. So I, I could go and just run this if I wanted to, but, but I don't. I want it to run on its own. So in the command line now, I'm going to issue, uh, let's see what we have running. I don't think we have anything except for the node red and the hello world. Okay, let's clear this. Now, since I'm, uh, again, in the same directory as my Docker Compose YAML file, now I can just issue this Docker Compose up command. And this should, what did I do? Should be a string. Um, Need a quote around it? No. Uh, I should, I shouldn't here. I think it's line six. Yeah, seven. I think so too. Oh, can, yeah, I need a container. Here. This is going to be um, um, dropping. There we go. There we go. So now this is going to do all my work for me. It's going to start my containers, uh, both of them. It's telling me now that, that they're running. Um, it's running in, in interactive terminals. So in this, I should be able to, to now go to my uh, local host, uh, port 8080. And in just a second, you should be able to see me here. Hello. Uh, I can take a snapshot now of my camera. And if I go to uh, 8989 and we log in, we'll have files here. So these are two Docker containers that are connected through ver uh, volumes and uh, running in parallel. Uh, and it took us only a couple of commands to get this up and running.
Okay, that's that's literally Docker in 32 minutes. Any any questions? Hey Jesse, I have a question for you. Um, can you talk about like uh, I'm sort of trying to grok the relationship between like it's not really an operating system in and of itself, and yet on the other hand, it's like we're calling out Ubuntu. Like, what can you talk about that and how that works? Kind of. There's definitely some like magic under the hood of of what it's virtualizing and what it's not. Um, it is, it's it's pulling all the resources and it's structuring itself in a way um, that differentiates like Ubuntu from Debian, for example. Um, the reason that those the reason that those both exist is because both of those operating systems have their own strengths and weaknesses. So certain things you may prefer the file structure and the the default tools built into Ubuntu versus. Um, versus Debian, and that's what that's essentially what Docker is is wrapping up in these containers is these same types of file structures, um, same types of directory structures, same same types of like command instructions and. Um, so the container, things. so the container will will be like, oh, I'm on Ubuntu, even though it's gone, even though it's on it, it's on, who knows what, like under the like on the, the primary OS level could be anything else, but like within the container, it'd be like, it, it thinks that it's, it, it thinks that it's Ubuntu because that's what it sees inside the container. Exactly. Okay. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. In fact, um, I think I spun it down, but if I, for example, if I switched back over to the Debian Linux and I, I did an execute command inside that Ubuntu container, um, the file structure would be an Ubuntu file structure. As far as that machine knows, it's, it's Ubuntu. And well, cool, thanks. So, yeah, that, that answers my question. Uh, yeah, those are, I guess, one of the things that I that I run past often is um, there are, you know, there's every like Linux based OS under the sun. And the most common one is to use like Alpine, right? Which is like super light and has a very like specific Alpine specific list of commands, but it allows you to build these applications on, on a super lightweight platform. So they're very portable. They, they run, they spin up and spin down quickly. Um, and yeah, they're, they're very lightweight on the, on the process in general. Other questions? I have another question, okay. Jesse, because I'll keep it going with the questions. Um, you can you can edit this for content later. Um, so I'm curious, like when you're running the node, like I, I'm just trying to wrap my head around it. Like it's not necessarily like recording the VM state because like when you hit debug console a couple of times, you shoot it over here. It's not necessarily going to have like, oh, here's the same debug console. Like because it's it's kind of like starting it it's almost like booting the machine versus like recording like if you hit pause on ver on like vmware fusion you start up you've got all your windows open it's not maintaining like memory state for example it's just like this is kind of like the spin up of it if i pull it, if i take it down and i shoot it over here it's spinning up you know kind of it's like a fresh boot versus like recording snapshot of of everything including like every state is that correct it is similar to recording a snapshot. Um, so, so when you do a Docker commit, for example, um, anything that you've installed in there persists in the snapshot and, uh, or excuse me, in the in the commit. Um, Yeah, but trying trying to like, but not like the running processes necessarily, or like the state of the memory of some, you know, like I'm just like, what's correct. what's what's non volatile versus volatile in terms of like transporting this thing, correct? I get yeah, in terms of it. Yeah, go ahead. Think of it like burning an ISO file from a from an image, right? Or right, burning an right. image file. No, that's from, perfect. Yep. Yeah. So if you've gone and you've installed all these applications and dumped all these resources into it, those persist. But you're, it's not like carrying data over from, well, it's not carrying like 
process data over from one to the other. It's right. It's not very, a. It's not like a RAM image. It's a disk image. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's a disk image. Yeah. So some cool ways to use this. Um, you know, if you've got if you've got a software package that you want to make it, you know, you want it to be easily deployable and you want it to be, you want to lock in like dependencies, right? You want to make sure that it's always run on, on like Ubuntu version 18, for example, because you know it works and you want it to have node version 12 and Python 3.7.9. You want to make sure it has all these specific versions. You can create your Docker image with these very specific dependencies uh, and wrap it all up in this known stable package. And you can get creative with the way that you create like tag names. So um, you want it to behave the same way on your x86 system as you do uh, on an ARM-based system. It's totally possible. You just build those images on each each of those machines from the same Docker file, and and they're they're going to work. Um, so that's that's one of the most important ways this is used. But it also modularizes the the software as well. So if you want it to be as easy as installing, you know. Uh, object detection over Python application with a single command line, uh, it's possible. Is Docker itself able to run on Linux, obviously, as you showed us, but Mac and Windows as well, or not? Mac, yes. Windows in like kind of, it's caveated. Um, you can't, it, it needs to use core OS resources, right? So. Um, I understand it'll run on Windows. I've never, I've never been brave enough or had the interest to try it. It does run very well on Mac OS. Um, I run it, I run it on my Mac OS to do um, things that I want to isolate from the rest of the operating system. So if I'm, for example, I want to spin up an MQTT broker, um, and I don't want I don't want it to persist on my Mac. I'll just run it in Docker, and then I can kill the the container, and kill the image, and it's gone. It's off my machine. I'm I'm thinking a little bit about like the context of using Docker in tandem with Git version control, maybe for like software testing or something. Um, and if you, you know, had a Docker instance that was your test environment, would you perhaps, would you be checking out a repository from within that Docker instance? And then, okay, yeah. Yep. That makes a lot of sense. All right, any other questions? Yeah, I got a quick one. Okay. Um, what about uh, like CPU overhead? Like, what's that look like when I fire up a VM? It's like my fans kick on, and <laughs> is it more efficient to run just a small Docker module, like or image container? That's it's such a great question. Um, in the past, I've worked on platforms that were really resource limited, and it meant you had to be aware of how you run images. And um, similar to a virtual machine where you, you can go in and, and throttle the memory and throttle the, you know, the allocated cores and whatnot, uh, you can do the same thing when you, when you invoke uh, a Docker container. So you can limit its memory, limit its um, you know, access to resources, CPU resources. Uh, everything I've shown you here is like full throttle. So um, they can weigh down the machine for sure. Um, but you have very tight control over how that, how that runs. And that can all be included in your Docker Compose. Um, 
to, to win the prize. Awesome. Thank you. Any other questions? How about a round of applause and thanks for Jesse. That was rad. Thanks, Jesse. Appreciate it. Coming yeah, thanks for joining us as usual. Thanks this a lot. Fun. <laughs> All right. Go loop. See ya. <laughs> Catch you. Yeah.